we're in the final week of our New Year's message series entitled When I Grow Up. When I Grow Up, the series has been a challenge for all of us grown-ups to keep growing up, uh, to have a vision for a better us in the future. So, and just because we're grown-ups now, we've been saying that, that we should not give up on growing up. There is still so much, so much more that we can accomplish in this life, and there's so much more that God wants for us in this life. Because there is a difference, we've been saying, between growing old and growing up. You know, growing old is negative. Growing old is getting worse. It means decay. It means eventual even death. But growing up is positive. It implies getting better. It, it means maturity. It implies strength and fruitfulness and vitality and the best of life. And I believe that this new year, this new year is the best is yet to come for us. And, and we want to experience that best life this year. So we've been trying to help you to envision a new you in this new year. Uh, a more grown-up you in, the, in three different areas, in the areas of our fitness, in the areas of our faith, and today in the areas of your finances. Now, many of us, whether we like to admit it or not, we can have kind of a, a childish perspective when it comes to our finances. Like a kid in a candy store sometimes, you know, we can walk around in life, you know, buying everything that looks sweet to us. Every shiny new thing that the marketers put in front of our face, we want to buy. And I remember as a kid getting to uh, every, every year as, as we as started to get close to Christmas, we would get these things in the mail, these giant catalogs of toy stores. Now, um, you know, if you're a millennial, you probably have no idea what a catalog is. A catalog was the, the toy store's website before there was an internet. And so the catalog is this three-inch thick, beautiful, glossy magazine of every toy a kid could ever dream about, every toy you could ever possibly want. And I remember as a kid wanting it all, all of it. I remember slowly turning through those pages, you know, on the, the floor of, of my bedroom, you know, drooling over every single RC remote control car and, and every Lego set and, and every action figure and getting out a, a marker or a pen and circling all the things that I like. Some of you did this too. And you circled it all and then you gave that catalog to your parents so they would know exactly what to get you for Christmas. And like a moth to a flame, you know, a kid in general is just drawn to want all of these toys. And as kids, we want everything. Children want every shiny, colorful new thing that they see. You know, marketers intentionally make things uh, for kids just extremely colorful because that attracts their eye and they just want to buy it just because it's so colorful. And, and then we grow up and we still want every shiny, new, colorful thing that's in front of us. The toys have all changed, but we haven't. Our tastes have all matured, but we haven't. We've grown old, but we haven't yet grown up when it comes to our finances, when it comes to our stuff. And today I want to help us all to start this process of growing up when it comes to our stuff, uh, when it comes to our finances. I want us to help I wanted to help us all to mature when it comes to our money. So today I want to give you three steps to start to mature with your money, to start to grow up in your finances. And the first two points really go together. They complement one another. So we're going to talk about those first two points all at the same time. So if you want to grow up financially, you need to, number one, spend less on short-term gratification. And number two, save more for long-term satisfaction. So part of growing up is learning to delay pleasure because sometimes Pleasure today means problems tomorrow. How many of you already know that to be true? You've already learned the hard way that pleasure today sometimes means problems tomorrow. Short-term gratification appears to be what you want, but it can rob you of long-term satisfaction. So an affair will probably bring you short-term gratification, but it definitely will rob you of long-term satisfaction. It will destroy your marriage and your relationships. Short-term gratification is it's a liar and it's a thief of, short, of, of long-term satisfaction. And in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life, a rich and satisfying life, he says, a satisfying life. It's also been said that when you don't sacrifice for what you want, what you want becomes the sacrifice. When you don't sacrifice for what you want, what you want becomes the sacrifice. 
I love to follow a financial guru named Dave Ramsey who always says, today if you live like no one else, later you can live and give like no one else. That means you live like no one else today. That means you learn to delay your pleasures. You, you don't spend as much on yourself. You don't allow yourself to buy all the same toys that everyone else is buying. You set a limit of, of how much you're going to spend on entertainment today and restaurants today and toys today and on clothes today. And instead you save for tomorrow. It doesn't mean that you live a miserable, unsatisfied life. No, it actually means the opposite. It actually means that you identify what is just short-term gratification versus what is long-term satisfaction. And instead of spending to gratify yourself in the short term, you choose instead to satisfy yourself in the long term by saving. And this is just a part of growing up, learning to delay gratification. It's, it's really difficult for adults it's extremely difficult for kids. I love this video that we'll watch together, and it kind of just displays this delayed gratification problem we all have. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. <laughs> I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. marshmallow but kids just can't seem to delay that short bit of gratification it is something that we have to learn as we mature as we grow up not as we grow old remember some of us still have a, a real problem with delaying gratification but as we grow up as we mature as we learn to delay short-term gratification in favor of long-term satisfaction so once we've decided to delay gratification in favor of long-term satisfaction, then how do we actually make that happen? 
after we decide to spend less and save more, we must devise a plan to spend less and to save more. So after we decide to change, we have to devise a plan to actually change. So we've got to devise a plan. So Dave Ramsey also says that children do what feels good. Adults devise a plan and follow it. Children do what feels good. Adults devise a plan and follow it. So what is your plan this new year? How have you, uh, you, you have to have a plan in order for you to hope to achieve any kind of real long-term satisfaction in life. You have to have a, this long-term vision of what you really want in the future in order to delay what you want right now. So you've got to have a plan. This is, this is common sense, but it's really not very common for any of us. You know, Jesus expects us grown-ups to be able to apply this principle of long-term vision, long-term thinking with our finances, just like he expects us to apply this same kind of long-term thinking, long-term satisfaction with, with any other thing in life. Like when he says in Luke chapter 14, verse 28 through 30, he says, but don't begin, don't begin a project, don't begin following Jesus, don't begin trying to live a new life, don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin a construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete, complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's that person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. You've got to count the cost. You've got to plan ahead. You've got to think long term, not just in the moment, because children do what feels good in the moment. Grown-ups devise a plan and follow it into the future. And that plan that grown-ups use to help them think longer term, to help them to spend less on short-term gratification and save more for long-term satisfaction is called a budget. It's a budget. Now, budget, I know, is a bad word. Budget gets a really bad rap, mainly for two reasons. Number one is that people don't like budgeting because they think that that word budget means cheap. And they don't like being cheap. They don't like cheap stuff. But budgeting doesn't mean cheap. We misuse that term as a cinnamon, as cin cin cinnamon? synonym <laughs> for cheap or for frugal. Uh, but really, that word budget has nothing to do with how cheap something is. Millionaires still live on, on budgets. That's a big part of the reason why they actually are millionaires. And millionaires buy really expensive stuff. So budget doesn't mean cheap. But the second reason that budgeting gets a bad rap is that Number two, people don't like being told no. And a budget sometimes tells you no. No, you shouldn't buy that. No, you shouldn't spend that. And people blame the budget for telling them no, which is really ridiculous if you stop and think about it, you know, because the budget isn't some almighty force from above that is telling you that you cannot spend that money, you know? No, it's, it's something, it's a document that you created. So if a budget is telling you no, then really, you are telling yourself no. And the reason you're telling yourself no is not because you're cheap. It's not because you're no fun. No, you're telling yourself no because you have already decided that what you really want most over the long term. And buying that new thing right now in the short term prevents you from what you really want most in the long term. Because you are the maker of the budget. So budgeting is simply telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. It's telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. Budgeting is this decision you make to spend your money on what will satisfy you, not necessarily what gratifies you. And you do this every single month if you budget. You do this every month or with every paycheck or whatever schedule you decide. You make a new budget every month. You devise a new plan, and then you spend your money according to that plan and that you devise, of course, it never goes exactly to plan. There's always stuff that happens during the month, but you adjust, you recalculate, you recount in your plan, and so, and you track your spending all along the way, and so that at the end of the month, you look back and you know exactly where your money went. It went exactly where you told it to go. You spent your money on the things that will satisfy you, not the things that will gratify you. So number one is spend less. Number two is save more. And the third thing you need to do to, when you, to grow up when it comes to your finances is, number three, give more than makes sense to math. So right now we've been kind of talking about how to make this math 
work. And I'm a math guy. I've always enjoyed math as a subject. Part of the reason why I landed such a beautiful wife is because in high school, I did her calculus homework for her. So <laughs> I understand how math works. All right, I get it. And here's what I've learned about giving. Giving away money makes no mathematical sense. It doesn't. And if your goal is to have as much money as you can ever have in life, if your goal is to be wealthy, then it would make more mathematical sense to say, never give anything away. Don't give a dime to anyone. Save it all for yourself. Invest it all for yourself. But if your goal is actually to mature when it comes to your money, if your goal is to grow up when it comes to your finances, then it's not just when you give something away, but when you give a lot away, that's when you begin to mature in your money. That's when you begin to grow up financially. When you give more away than makes sense to even math, you will start to grow up financially. Because giving is not natural to a child. There is there's a word that you have to teach children when they're growing up, and that word is share. Share. There is a word that you never have to teach to your children. They, they learn it all by themselves, and that word is mine. All mine. <laughs> Babies learn this word. It can be one of the first words they learn. But we have to teach them to share, and then we have to teach them to give, not just to give, but to give generously. To give beyond what's just fair. You know, kids are obsessed with fair. We need to push uh, each other to give past what's just fair. Because that's when we grow in maturity in our finances. Not just grow old, but we grow up when we start to give beyond what makes sense to math. So this year, don't grow old. Grow up. Don't put off giving until later in life. I know that's kind of the, in the back of the, our mind for a lot of us is, is we're going to put this off until we have a little bit more in life. I know that we're doing that. Later, when you have more money, you're thinking, you know, when I have more, then I'll give more. The problem is, that's not the way it works. And that never happens. Later, when you have more money, you will not give any more money. So, and here's what I mean. Today is already later. Today is later than it was five years ago. As you look back on your giving, and on your generosity towards others. Are you giving more of your, a bigger percentage of your paycheck today than you were five years ago? What about 10 years ago? What about 15 years ago? Today is later. And you probably haven't changed very much in terms of the percentage of your giving. Later just keeps coming with every day. You keep getting older, but your giving has yet to grow up. Now the stats show that as someone's income increases, the percentage of money that they actually give away decreases. In other words, people think when I make more money, I'll be able to afford to give more. It, you know, that makes mathematical sense in our head. I'll be able to afford giving a higher percentage of our money away, but then what actually happens is we don't give more money away. But you know who that stat is not true for? It's, it's not true for tithers because tithers have decided I'm always going to give at least 10% of my income, 10% off the top. So their income grows and they keep cutting off 10% off the top as their income grows. And eventually for tithers, they do get to a point in their, their growing income where they're comfortable and they begin to say, you know, well, maybe I'll give 10.5% this year. Maybe I'll give 11% this year. Or maybe we'll, we'll start giving more money to more organizations. We'll start giving more money away to our family members. And they can, they can make this step easily because for their whole working careers, they have made this commitment to give 10% and beyond. And I also know, I know that you can make a really, really strong argument, a biblical argument, a valid biblical argument for not tithing. And I've shared that with you before in this church, that you technically don't have to tithe. You can make a very strong biblical argument against tithing. That is not something that Jesus expects for us to do today. It's just maybe something of the past. I actually just read an article from a well-respected organization called the Gospel Coalition that basically came to that very conclusion, that that command to tithe is really not relevant for us today. But, but I believe that if you are looking for reasons to give less, then that tells me that you need to give more. If you are looking for reasons to give less, then you are the one who needs to give more. If you're searching the scriptures 
as a way to justify the fact that you don't give 10%. And that just tells me that you need to search your heart just as much. Because Jesus never, he never justified ways of giving less to people. He never looked for ways to give less to people. As followers of Jesus, we should never, never look for ways to give less to others. We need to have an honest conversation with ourselves. We need to search our hearts and find out why is it? Why is it that giving away so much money is so difficult for me? What is it that's holding me back from this? Because part of growing up, part of growing in maturity is, is not looking for ways to do the bare, bare minimum and to get by. Part of maturity is taking responsibility. It's doing what is right. It's doing what needs to be done. And whether or not you're going to give a big percentage of your money away, and whether or not that makes any mathematical sense to you at all, you need to give a, a, a mathematical craziness away because if you, if you want to grow up financially. I was really very, very proud of my wife, Nikki, recently because my son, Levi, I think I mentioned last week to you that he's been working really hard doing all these extra jobs around the house to earn some money so that he could buy a Nintendo Switch. And when we were giving him his earnings after, you know, hundred something dollars that he had earned, we reminded him, okay, now we've given you this amount. So how much do you put in your give bank? 10%. And how much do you put in your save bank? You put 10%. And, and when he saw that large sum of money start to leave his hands, he was a little surprised at how much money he was giving away, just how much it was. It, but we were quick to remind him, you know, 10% of $100 is only $10. But 10% of $1,000 is $100. And 10% of $100,000 is $10,000. So you need to learn now how to give 10% of what you make because as you start to earn more and more and more later on in life, that number that you're giving away just grows and grows and grows. And then Nikki chimed in and I was so proud. We hadn't even ever talked about anything like this before, but she just kind of laid it out there for me. She said, and just so you know, we're teaching you to do this sort of thing now and we expect you to keep giving away 10% to God as you grow up. And just so you know, your dad and I are going to have Plenty of money later on down the line when we grow up, when we grow old. Money that we can then choose to give to you, or we can choose not to give to you. And if you're not giving money away to God, if you're not giving away 10% to God's kingdom and to God's church, then you're not getting a dime from us, she said. And I was like, dang! <laughs> Drop the mic right there. And... Because here's the reality. If you don't give now, you won't give when you grow up. As your salary grows, your lifestyle will grow, your, but your giving will just stall out. And the grown-up life that you've always wanted to lead, the satisfying life that you've imagined for yourself, where you were generous and kind to others, and you were overflowing with grace and generosity towards God's kingdom and towards those in need, That'll never happen. If you don't start growing up now, you'll grow old, but you'll never grow up. You'll grow old and stingy, old and miserly, old, but never generous. And there's a story that Matthew, uh, Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14, of this choice that we have when it comes to the stuff that God entrusts us with, even the finances that God entrusts us with. And I'm sure you've heard this parable before, but as we read it today, I want you to particularly think of it in terms of the finances with which God has entrusted you and what you are going to do about it. So it's this parable found in Matthew 25, starting in verse 14. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. Then he left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. 
The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had been who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount so that I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man invest, or harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered, gathered crops I didn't cultivate. Why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from the servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. Those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now there's a real challenge to us in this parable a challenge to use everything that we've been given wisely to make the very best of what's been given to us and to stop waiting. Stop letting fear of of risk or change keep us from living the kind of life that we really want to live, that we're called to live, this rich and satisfying life. So grow up today. So that when you grow old in the future, you'll be able to look back on the life that you've lived and the way you've stewarded your your fitness and the way you've lived a life of faith and the way that you've managed your finances. And so that when you grow old, we'll be able to hear those words of our master and our savior when he returns to say, well done, good and faithful. (laughs) Let me pray for us today. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father. Thank you for this rich and satisfying life that you've blessed us with. Thank you for giving us so much. Thank you for this, for satisfying every need that we have. Thank you for the gift of your son who offers us real satisfying life. A life of forgiveness, a life of grace, a life lived in relationship with you. So loving God, as we participate in communion today, remind us of this generous life that you've offered to us and this desire to live in a relationship with us. Remind us of the generous life that you gave for us, giving your life so that we could live. A love that caused you to die for us. Your body was broken and your blood was shed for us out of love. Thank you. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you come and fill this place, that you would fill this bread and juice with your presence, that as we fill our bodies with bread dipped in juice, we wouldn't just be filled with bread and juice, we'd be filled with the very Spirit of God, the Spirit of a loving God, the Spirit of a generous God, a grace-filled God. So fill us with your Spirit's presence today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.